This episode and every episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Ironmonger Brewing. Visit Ironmonger at their tap room in Marietta, Georgia, or online at ironmongerbrewing.com. Open up a tab, grab a seat, and pour a pint. It's time for the Beer Guys Radio Show. You want free beer? Go to the brewery. Dedicated to the art, science, and enjoyment of craft beer. Yeah, what's wrong with the beer we got? Now, here are your hosts, Tim Dennis and Brian Hewitt. And welcome to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We are broadcasting from the Beer Guys Radio Studios in Marietta, Georgia. And this week, we're talking with Palmetto Brewing Company. I'm Tim Dennis, and with me, as always, is my good friend and co-host, Brian Hewitt. And he's going to tell us a little bit more about our guest this week. Hey, Tim. So uh, joining us today, we have Bill Pyatt, the founder and CEO of Catawba Brewing Company and the owner of Palmetto Brewing Company. We're going to talk about uh, South Carolina beer history and merging breweries and, you know, any kind of other interesting things that come up as a result of that. All and, that stuff. Yes. Huh? Indeed. Okay. All right. Billy, thanks for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. Glad to be here. Billy, we just opened uh, one of your beers here. We have your Idle Speed, a salted lime lager. Can you tell us a little bit about this one? Well, absolutely. First of all, it's perfect for a beautiful day like we're having down in Charleston, South Carolina today. 77, sunny, no wind. Get out on the waterway and just putter around. This is a really easy drinking, um, kind of a Pilsner lager, crisp, um, crisp beer with a hint of salt and a little twist of lime. And I had a friend tell me the other night we were at a sushi restaurant these were perfect accompaniment for that. And the guy goes, this goes down like a missile. And uh, yeah. I believe it. And at four and a half percent, you can have a couple. Yeah, you can you can fire the missile a few times, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this would go well with sushi. Yeah, it, it or the or idling, kicking back, taking it easy. A lot of Asian food, anything Thai, probably. Uh, there's a yeah. lot of a lime influence there. I think this would be very complimentary to that. And possibly some of the lighter Mexican food items too. That would probably go I think well you're with right. that. Yeah. Probably would. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I like that idea. As a matter of fact, uh, that's what I'm going to have tonight. You've made up my mind. See, All there right. we go. We're solving problems here. <laughs> that's Good right. stuff. Brian, a busy week or actually not as busy as some of our previous weeks. We've had a little crazy month or so, uh, but we've kind of settled in. Uh, what'd you get into this week? So I think the biggest thing I got into was uh, our visit over to Burnt Hickory Brewery, where we we sampled a number of things. A lot of digits were had, uh, double digits and uh, digits Killboy Powerhead, which is a personal favorite of mine. Um, I'm trying to think that was there another digits? Oh no, I'm thinking Char- digits, double digits, and and digits is Burnt Hickory's uh, Blood Orange, yes, uh, IPA, and uh, double digits doubles up on that. And as you mentioned, Killboy Powerhead brings the cream sickle action to the and party. I think I'm not 100 percent sure on this, but I think it's the OG Blood Orange IPA. It is in Georgia. Georgia's OG That's Blood Orange say. IPA, yeah. which Burnt Hickory's owner Scott Hadeen is very proud of. Yes, you know, let he you is. Know about that, he got that going. So yeah, that was a lot of fun. And you know, something I want to say for that kind of came to fruition from our trip there uh, for our followers. If you'll take a look at our website, BeerGuysRadio.com. We're running the competition right now. Yeah, If you're in Georgia or even if you're outside of Georgia, if you're in Georgia, then I think it will pay off a little bit better if you win this competition. But Burnt Hickory approached us and offered us to do a collaboration cast with them for their anniversary party. And uh, through talks with Scott Hadeen, we decided that we would uh, crowdsource it, let people vote on what cask to do, what additions to put in there, the winner would get their cask made for the anniversary. They'd get to tap the cask, get the first pour of it. They'll also get two VIP passes to the anniversary party, get to come out there and enjoy it. We'll give them some beer guy swag and some burnt hickory swag. So that is running through the 25th. Get in there, give us your suggestions at beerguysradio.com. That sounds really cool. And I think one of my f- favorite parts of it is you get to not only come up with the the cast creation, but you need to cook up the name, too. So some of those you know, names. I didn't even think of that, but everybody's given their names there. So good. Names. I assume they're giving us crazy names yes. for the beers. Yeah. I'm the, like, you know what? I didn't say that in the rules, but people are running with it. There. The wilder the name, the more I like it. So, yeah. I mean, and I do like wild ingredients and, and various yeah. things. So. And you know you're not eligible, right, Brian? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about going in covertly. <laughs> yes, yeah. Run <laughs> undercover there. Oh, we'll find you out, though. So. Oh, sure. Now, Billy, we talked to you just before we came on the air there. You said you are, you're actually 
talking to us is kind of a break for you. You've been working really hard this week, right? Yes, uh, absolutely. Since we purchased Palmetto in December of 2017, we've had a lot of projects down here in Charleston. First year, we just concentrated on building a big old brewery down here. We increased capacity, modernized the brew house, hired a lot of brewing professionals. And we just really, just now, uh, about, you know, 12, 15 months into that process, have gotten our wheels under us and are doing well. So now we're turning our focus into updating our retail space. When our customers come visit us here in the Holy City, uh, have a chance to uh, see a little bit of what we do. Uh, we're trying to nicen up our tasting rooms, increase the outdoor space. We've got a beautiful enclosed courtyard that is going to be opening, grand opening or grand reopening, as it were, this Saturday, the 18th. I will be featuring a, a brand new draft system with 30 taps of Catawba and Palmetto beers. We have two days to put it together, and we still haven't built the cooler box yet. So we got, <laughs> we're going to be pulling some all-nighters tonight and tomorrow. So thank you for giving me a little break today. I was going to say, this little break, you'll need every bit of energy that it, that it earned you, right? Absolutely. Uh, good stuff. We're here to help out. <laughs> we are. So, Tim, I think it's time that we talk about the beers of the week. Crack open a cold one. It's the Truck and Tap Beer of the Week. Woo-hoo! Craft beer and food trucks in downtown Woodstock. Truckandtap.com. Well, Brian, as always, we've got a nice selection of beers here in the studio. As mentioned earlier, we got into Palmetto's Idle Speed Salted Lime Lager. We're also getting into their nice and bright Goza a little bit later. And uh, for you, Brian, I think this was just for you, their Evening Joe, their Coffee Blonde, which I know you're a big fan of that style. I'm excited. Yeah, Yeah. I like I like the lighter, the lighter styles uh, with with coffee in them. I think they do really well. Lighter, sweeter cream ales, blonde ales. I think my favorite coffee delivery vehicle is a cream ale. Of the ones I've tried, coffee cream ales are really nice. They are. Yeah, I I can't disagree with that. Yeah, good stuff. And Brian, we did get... uh, we pre-gamed with a little Terrapin Hop and Bubbly, which is their Brute IPA in collaboration with Miller High Life. What did you think of that, Tim? So, Brian, you know, this beer has caused a lot of uh, chatter online, we'll yes. say, because <laughs> you know the opinions of big beer, and you know that uh, we have our opinions on big beer. We, sure. give, we give Terrapin a bit of a pass because they're friends of ours from a, a long time back, and uh, their tap room up here at the uh, SunTrust Park, the Brave Stadium, they do some really nice stuff there. They really cool really, guys. Yeah. And we actually tried the pilot batch of this we Hop did. and Bubbly before it came out. I liked it, Brian. I thought the Hop and Bubbly was good. I, I don't know. I have had what I would consider better Brute IPAs. More true to what I think the Brute IPA style is. But I enjoyed this beer. I thought it was fun. What did you think of it, Brian? I thought it was pretty good. And okay. I'm, I'm not sure if it's a little bias on my part, but I got a little Millerish thing going in there that I can't put my finger on it. But after sipping on it for a little while, I warmed up to it. I okay, mean, I think it's right. I think it's solid. It's definitely not my favorite brewed IPA, but it's it's good, and I love the can art. I really really like the can, the can art's art. Cool. I love that. Yeah. So we enjoyed that. We also have a terrapin barista that they sent out to us, Brian, that we've got in the fridge okay. that we might get into later, and a couple others. So Brian, what is happening this week in the news? What's in the news? The beer guys have the scoop. Extra, extra, read all about it. Time for headlines. All right, so we haven't had a chance yet to talk about the biggest recent news, but uh, there is something big happening in the world of beer. It's Boston Beer Company and Dogfish Head. They are merging. It's being called a merger anyway, but it's really Boston Beer Company buying Dogfish Head for about $300 million. So the founders of Dogfish Head are getting about 406,000 shares of Boston beer stock worth roughly $127 million. And the shareholders of Dogfish Head are getting $173 million, hence the $300 million total. Sam Calajone is going to get a seat on the board of Boston Beer Company starting in 2020. And the word is both companies will retain their Brewers Association craft brewery designation. I'm curious how they will rank in the uh, the top craft breweries list the next time because Sam Adams is the second largest, Dogfish Head was the 13th largest. Will their combined powers take the number one spot from Yingling? It will be easy to see how this pans out. It was a surprise. Yes, I, oh, I did not sure. see that one coming for sure of all the mergers and acquisitions and stuff out there. And uh, I don't know, man. I'm curious. And the first thing I thought of when I saw the news was, will they still be considered a craft brewery? Because I know that Samuel Adams alone, Boston Beer Company alone, had really pushed the limits of uh, that definition. And they're not number one either. So, I yeah. Mean. Okay. Interesting. Well, Brian, that's all 
the time we got for news this week since we had a little chatter there. You're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We are going to take a break, but we'll be back very soon to talk more with Palmetto Brewing. Brian and Tim, the beer guys. If you're like us, no lunch or dinner is complete without a pint or two of craft beer. Which is why Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth are always on our list. Tim, why do they call it Truck and Tap? Well, the tap part is easy, Brian. They've got 18 of them. As for the truck part, that's where it gets interesting. Truck and Tap features your favorite Atlanta area food trucks, so you're getting a different menu every day. Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth. Truckandtap.com. Let them know that the beer guys sent you. We are Reformation Brewery, celebrating the reformer in you. Locally crafted within the renowned Etowah watershed of Woodstock, Georgia, Reformation creates yeast-forward brews full of aroma and flavor crafted to last. Come see us in beautiful Woodstock, Georgia, for a tour and tasting of unique brews that you can't find anywhere else. Reformation Brewery, set beer free. ReformationBrewery.com the beer guys on facebook twitter and instagram you passed out cigarettes for a smoke on on earth day you installed speed bumps on the handicapped ramp and most recently you dumped a hundred pounds of meat on a peaceful vegan protest oh come on that was way more than a hundred pounds now back to the beer guys radio show Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. If you miss an episode, don't worry. All episodes are available as a podcast. Subscribe on your favorite podcasting app and never miss a show. Now back to Billy Pyatt from Palmetto Brewing Company and Catawba. Billy, we are getting ready to open another one of your beers here. We have a nice and bright Goza. Can you tell us about this one? Oh, gladly. So the first thing, uh, take a look at the can. Uh, it and the idle speed are in our brand new branding. Uh, we changed all of our labels just this March, Palmetto needed a, a, an upgrade. So we did everything from uh, new signage, n- new cans, new website, and everything is looking nice and fresh. So the Goza that you're drinking is a lemon elderflower Goza. It's going to be a little bit tart from a kettle souring process. It's going to have a little hint of citrus, of course, from the lemons and a little herbal quality from the flowers. It is going to be relatively light in alcohol, very thirst quenching, uh, and it is doing very well. I'll point out that the can, the interesting part about the can label is that that is the Folly Beach, South Carolina Pier at sunrise. And to me, it's just beautiful orange and yellows and purples in that label. And it kind of captures the spirit of the low country down here. You know, I was going to say that was sunset. And then I remembered we're talking South Carolina, which is on the (laughs) East Coast. Yeah. Yeah. We are facing almost dead south at Folly. So the sun comes up to your left and sets on your right. Okay, very nice. And I see here, so we've got nice and bright Goza, which is you, you which has your sunrise covered. Mm-hmm. Then idle speed there. They're out enjoying the day on the on the water, kicking around, feet hanging off the side of the boat. And then we have some evening Joe over here, Brian. You've pretty much got your full day covered. It's an entire day of drinking with the beers there. So they're set. Yeah. Brian, I'm gonna sip on this beer and I think you had a little something you want to talk to Billy about, right? Oh yeah. You know, so we just had a, a big story about a merger of two big breweries, and it occurred to me this week, you would know, Billy, all about that because you are involved in merging Palmetto and Catawba breweries. And so you you have a lot of background and would have, I would think, some really interesting insight on this. What what can you tell us about the whole process of merging breweries? What What is your insight on this? Well, it, it is. It's near and dear to my heart. Certainly a much smaller scale than Sam Adams and Dogfish had, but it was a big deal to us. We put together, uh, call it a 20,000 barrel brewery in Catawba and a 13,000 barrel brewery in Palmetto. But, and we were forced to integrate not only the locations and, and the logistics of getting beer from each brewery, uh, we now have four brewing locations to the customers, but we had to integrate uh, product quality, product consistency, we are able to make every beer in every other manufacturing facility. And that is something that Sam Adams has always been amazing at doing. So I got to think that of all the things that we struggled with, 
beer consistency, flavor matching, that Sam Adams is going to be able to make whatever dogfish brands that they need to make anywhere they need to make it. They're very good at it. But the biggest part that we um, took seriously and paid a lot of attention to is the cultures. Uh, Palmetto was a family-owned business. Catawba was a family-owned business. And it was like a marriage. We were putting two Southern families together. And it didn't take more than six months to make us feel like we were one team. But I got to tell you, it was something that we treaded very lightly around positions, pay scales. Uh, everyone had a job. We didn't release anyone. It was it was very important that no one um, felt like they were taken advantage of because we did want to maintain this family atmosphere in our companies. The other part that I'm sure Sam Adams and, and Dogfish Head are going to be um, figuring out is how to overlap distribution channels. We were lucky a lot of our distribution channels were the same. However, some of them weren't, and we had to go back and negotiate ways to get those separate distributors in any geographical area consolidated because, as you know, we only really can deal with one distributor in any geographical area. So those were the highlights, I guess, from from our point of view. We're still learning. We're only, oh, call it 14, 15 months into this for us, but we finally feel like we're hitting on seven and a half cylinders out of eight. Oh, That's nice. pretty good. Yeah, That's pretty not good. Not bad. Not bad. Not if you're an actual engine, seven and a half <laughs> cylinders, you you have some trouble. But we're almost there. Almost there. Right. So the distribution is a very real concern. I've read about that, and they I think they're about fifty percent of the time they're sharing the same distributor. There's a there's a going to be a consolidation effort there. I'm sure that's a major consideration considering how big they are. But yeah, I mean. All the things you've said, I think, translate almost directly to what they're going to have to go through. And they're keeping all their people. So it's going to be an interesting process of integrating everything with the different cultures there. Very interesting stuff. It will be. Yeah. I'm curious to see how it all plays out. See what uh, what new products we may get out of it. You know, with Sam Adams and uh, Dogfish Head working together, it could be interesting. It could. Yes, indeed. It definitely could now, be. Now, speaking of interesting, so Palmetto Brewing has an interesting story. So if I understand correctly, Billy, they were the first brewery to open uh, pre or post prohibition in the U S and I believe the current uh, iteration of Palmetto is a re relaunch of the original brand. Is that correct? Yes. Well, well almost I, we okay. were the first, yeah. Palmetto was the first brewery to open in South Carolina after prohibition. I'm sure that there are other breweries out there that are older than 26 years old. We are 26 years old here. I'm very proud of that. Uh, but we, I don't think we led the charge. That was probably from the West Coast, uh, as I remember. But we're certainly very happy uh, to be carrying the torch here in the Southeast. Um, and yes, the rebranding, uh, we have so much, 25 years of culture, 25 years of low country, that we want to make sure that people understand we're not giving any of that up. So the rebranding we're doing is really more to call us back home. Uh, the corporate logo still evokes the wrought iron gates of Charleston. The beer logos evoke scenes that you'll find all around, uh, you know, from Savannah to Wilmington, North Carolina, and the in the coastal areas. Um, low country look for our lager. The Huge Street IPA looks like the street the brewery is on. The Folly Beach Pier we already mentioned. It really is just trying to make sure that people understand that uh, we're drawing a lot of inspiration from the coastal Carolinas. I've been looking at these cans and I, I love the new designs. I, I happen to get a little uh, eye shot of some of the, the previous designs. I, I'm It looks to me like in addition to updating the packaging to these new designs, you went all can from being, was it all bottle before? It was before I bought the company, it was bottles and cans in a mix. And uh, Catawba really never did anything in bottles. So one of the first things that we had to rationalize was, do we keep a bottling line and continue to support it? Or do we go with the area that is got, it has the most consumer preference and the most consumer growth. And we're in the low country where people do a lot of outdoor activities. It's just much safer it's easier. It's actually even cheaper uh, to carry your beer in cans uh, anywhere you want to go. So we um, stopped putting beer in bottles early last year, and it's gone over very well. Our distributors and our retailers have been very, very supportive, and we certainly appreciate that. Portability, especially being in uh, Charleston, you want to be Amen. able to take it anywhere you need there. Absolutely. Yep. So I wanted to know, one of the things I was curious about is P Palmetto existed before the uh, prohibition, 
um, and has a, a history of like 50 plus years of, of brewing various beers. I think some of them were like German styles or whatever. I'm curious if you've looked into what was brewed back then and if you've tried to recreate any of those recipes, you know, in modern times. It's a great, que- it's a great question. And, and really, uh, we have been so focused on product matching between our brewing facilities so that we can make sure that the Palmetto beer that you get out of Charleston, and if we manufacture it in North Carolina, uh, that it's uh, the same beer you, that people love. But that's on our list of things to do, is to do a little more digging and, and come up with some of the historical recipes. One, th- one beer that we are making um, all the time is Palmetto Amber, and it is the first craft beer I ever had in South Carolina some 24, 25 years ago. And I'm very happy every time I get a chance to pull that handle at a uh, see that handle pulled at a restaurant or uh, and uh, experience what really made me fall in love with craft beer in South Carolina a long time ago. That's we were just talking about amber ales the other day and how you don't see as many of those anymore. You know, if you look at the '90s, that was a staple. Brew pubs, sure. especially, it was a staple. You had to have an amber or red ale on tap. Think about that fat it, tire those days. You know, everybody's going yeah. nuts over the ambers, you know. Had to be there. Good stuff. Well, you're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take a quick break, but we'll be back very soon to talk more with Palmetto Brew. Is your brewery or restaurant flooring looking a little worse for wear? Your foundation needs to be protected from heat, chemicals, and other contaminants. At the same time, you need something slip resistant yet cleanable with soap and water. ResTech has been manufacturing port and place flooring since 2002 and offers a variety of solutions for your facility's needs. If your floor needs a little TLC, visit our website at ResTech.net. That's R E S T E K.net to contact us and request a free site evaluation. Brian and Tim, the beer guys. If you're like us, no lunch or dinner is complete without a pint or two of craft beer. Which is why Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth are always on our list. Tim, why do they call it Truck and Tap? Well, the tap part is easy, Brian. They've got 18 of them. As for the truck part, that's where it gets interesting. Truck and Tap features your favorite Atlanta area food trucks, so you're getting a different menu every day. Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth. Truckandtap.com. Let them know that the beer guys sent you. the beer guys on facebook twitter and instagram you passed out cigarettes for a smoke on on earth day you installed speed bumps on the handicapped ramp and most recently you dumped a hundred pounds of meat on a peaceful vegan protest oh come on that was way more than a hundred pounds now back to the beer guys radio show Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. If you miss an episode, don't worry. All episodes are available as a podcast. Subscribe on your favorite podcasting app and never miss a show. Now back to Billy Pyatt from Palmetto Brewing Company and Catawba. Billy, we are getting ready to open another one of your beers here. We have a nice and bright Goza. Can you tell us about this one? Oh, gladly. So the first thing, uh, take a look at the can. Uh, it and the Idle Speed are in our brand new branding. Uh, we changed all of our labels just this March, Palmetto needed uh, an upgrade. So we did everything from uh, new signage, n- new cans, new website, and everything is looking nice and fresh. So the Goza that you're drinking is a lemon elderflower Goza. It's going to be a little bit tart from a kettle souring process. It's going to have a little hint of citrus, of course, from the lemons and a little herbal quality from the flowers. It is going to be relatively light in alcohol, very thirst quenching, uh, and it is doing very well. I'll point out that the can, the interesting part about the can label is that that is the Folly Beach, South Carolina Pier at sunrise. And to me, okay. it's just beautiful orange and yellows and purples in that label. And it kind of captures the spirit of the low country down here. You know, I was going to say that was sunset. And then I remembered we're talking South Carolina, which is on the <laughs> East Coast. Yeah. yeah. We are yeah. facing almost dead south at Folly. So the sun comes up to your left and sets on your right. Okay, very nice. And I see here, so we've got nice and bright Goza, which is you, you which has your sunrise covered. Mm-hmm. Then idle speed there. They're out enjoying the day on the on the water, kicking around, feet hanging off the side of the boat. And then we have some evening Joe over here, Brian. You've pretty much got your full day covered. It's the entire day of drinking with the beers there. So they're set. Yeah. Brian, I'm gonna sip on this beer, and I think you had it uh, 
little something you want to talk to Billy about, right? Oh, yeah. You know, so we just had a, a big story about a merger of two big breweries, and it occurred to me this week, you would know, Billy, all about that because you are involved in merging Palmetto and Catawba breweries. So you you have a lot of background and would have, I would think, some really interesting insight on this. What what can you tell us about the whole process of merging breweries? What What is your insight on this? Well, it, it is. It's near and dear to my heart. Certainly a much smaller scale than Sam Adams and Dogfish had, but it was a big deal to us. We put together, uh, call it a 20,000 barrel brewery in Catawba and a 13,000 barrel brewery in Palmetto. But, and we were forced to integrate not only the locations and, and the logistics of getting beer from each brewery. Uh, we now have four brewing locations to the customers, but we had to integrate uh, product quality, product consistency. We are able to make every beer in every other manufacturing facility. And that is something that Sam Adams has always been amazing at doing. So I, I got to think that of all the things that we struggled with, beer consistency, flavor matching, that Sam Adams is going to be able to make whatever dogfish brands that they need to make anywhere they need to make it. They're very good at it. But the biggest part that we um, took seriously and paid a lot of attention to is the cultures. Uh, Palmetto was a family-owned business. Catawba was a family-owned business. And it was like a marriage. We were putting two Southern families together. And it didn't take more than six months to make us feel like we were one team. But I got to tell you, it was something that we treaded very lightly around positions, pay scales. Uh, everyone had a job. We didn't release anyone. It was it was very important that no one um, felt like they were taken advantage of because we did want to maintain this family atmosphere in our companies. The other part that I'm sure Sam Adams and, and Dogfish Head are going to be um, figuring out is how to overlap distribution channels. We were lucky a lot of our distribution channels were the same. However, some of them weren't, and we had to go back and negotiate ways to get those separate distributors in any geographical area consolidated because, as you know, we only really can deal with one distributor in any geographical area. So those were the highlights, I guess, from, from our point of view. We're still learning. We're only, oh, call it 14, 15 months into this for us, but we finally feel like we're hitting on seven and a half cylinders out of eight. Oh, nice. That's pretty good. Yeah, That's pretty not good. Not bad. Not bad. Not if you're an actual engine, seven and a half <laughs> cylinders, you'd, you'd have some trouble. But we're almost there. Almost there. Right. So the distribution is a very real concern. I've read about that, and they, I think, they're about fifty percent of the time they're sharing the same distributor. There's a, there's a going to be a consolidation effort there. I'm sure that's a major consideration considering how big they are. But yeah, I mean, all the things you said, I think translate almost directly to what they're going to have to go through and they're keeping all their people. So it's going to be an interesting process of integrating everything with the different cultures there. Very interesting stuff. It will be. Yeah. I'm curious to see how it all plays out. See what, uh, what new products we may get out of it, you know, with Sam Adams and, uh, Dogfish Head working together could be interesting. It could. Yes, indeed. It definitely could now, be. Now, speaking of interesting, so Palmetto Brewing has an interesting story. So if I understand correctly, Billy, they were the first brewery to open uh, pre or post-prohibition in the U.S. And I believe the current uh, iteration of Palmetto is a re relaunch of the original brand is that correct yes well, well almost i we okay. were the first yeah palmetto was the first brewery to open in south carolina after prohibition i'm sure that there are other breweries out there that are older than 26 years old we are 26 years old here i'm very proud of that uh but we, i don't think we led the charge that was probably from the west coast uh, as i remember but we're certainly very happy uh to be carrying the torch here in the southeast um and yes the rebranding uh, we have so much 25 years of culture, 25 years of low country that we want to make sure that people understand we're not giving any of that up. So the rebranding we're doing is really more to call us back home. Uh, the corporate logo still evokes the wrought iron gates of Charleston. The beer logos evoke scenes that you'll find all around, uh, you know, from Savannah to Wilmington, North Carolina and in the, in the coastal areas. Um, low country look for our lager. The Hugie Street IPA looks like the street the brewery is on. The Folly Beach Pier we already mentioned. It really is just trying to make sure that people understand that uh, we're drawing a lot of inspiration from the coastal Carolinas. I've been looking at these cans and I, I love the new designs. I, I happen to get a little uh, eye shot of some of the, the previous designs. I, I'm 
it looks to me like in addition to updating the packaging to these new designs, you went all can from being, was it all bottle before? It was before I bought the company, it was bottles and cans in a mix. And uh, Catawba really never did anything in bottles. So one of the first things that we had to rationalize was, do we keep a bottling line and continue to support it? Or do we go with the area that is got, it has the most consumer preference and the most consumer growth? And we're in the low country where people do a lot of outdoor activities. It's just much safer. It's easier. It's actually even cheaper uh, to carry your beer in cans uh, anywhere you want to go. So we um, stopped putting beer in bottles early last year. And it's gone over very well. Our distributors and our retailers have been very, very supportive. And we certainly appreciate that. Portability, especially being in uh, Charleston. You want to be Amen. able to take it anywhere you need there. Absolutely. Yep. So I wanted to know, one of the things I was curious about is pa Palmetto existed before the uh, prohibition um, and has a, a history of like 50 plus years of, of brewing various beers. I think some of them were like German styles or whatever. I'm curious if you've looked into what was brewed back then and if you've tried to recreate any of those recipes, you know, in modern times. It's, great que it's a great question. And, and really, uh, we have been so focused on product matching between our brewing facilities so that we can make sure that the Palmetto beer that you get out of Charleston, and if we manufacture it in North Carolina, uh, that it's uh, the same beer you, that people love. But that's on our list of things to do, is to do a little more digging and, and come up with some of the historical recipes. One, th one beer that we are making um, all the time is Palmetto Amber, and it is the first craft beer I ever had in South Carolina some 24, 25 years ago. And I'm very happy every time I get a chance to pull that handle at or uh, see that handle pulled at a restaurant or uh, and uh, experience what really made me fall in love with craft beer in South Carolina a long time ago. That's we were just talking about Amber Ales the other day and how you don't see as many of those anymore. You know, if you look at the 90s, that was a staple. Brew pubs sure. especially, it was a staple. You had to have an Amber or Red L on tap. Think about that fat Ooh. tire those days. You know, everybody's going yeah. nuts over the Ambers, you know. Had to be there. Good stuff. Well, you're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take a quick break, but we'll be back very soon to talk more with Palmetto Brew. Craft beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their tap room in Marietta, Georgia to taste and see. Also visit their barrel room for an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing. Establishing a new standard in craft beer. As a brewery owner or taproom manager, are you looking for ways to enhance your customer experience while maximizing your revenues? Craft Seller is a mobile solution that helps your brewery drive sales and attract new customers through online pre-sales for beer releases, events, and memberships. Get details now at craftseller.com. Mention Beer Guys Radio after sign-up and extend your free trial to a full 30 days. Remember, craftseller.com, C-R-A-F-T-C-E-L-L-R.com. the beer guys on facebook twitter and instagram well i'm sure i'd feel much worse if i weren't under such heavy sedation now back to the beer guys radio show welcome back to the beer guys radio show if you enjoy the show please consider supporting us on patreon just go to patreon.com slash beer guys patrons get some cool perks like beer guys swag and commercial free episodes now more from billy pyatt and palmetto brewing company and Catawba. Yes, Brian. And speaking of Catawba, we have spent our day from sunrise on through the daytime on the water with Palmetto. And now we're dipping into the evening. We've got some Catawba Evening Joe here, which is a coffee blonde ale, which I'm enjoying quite a lot. But uh, Billy, can you tell us a little bit about Old Evening Joe here? Yeah, Evening Joe is a brand new beer that we released into five-state distribution this year. It started as a one-off beer we made in Asheville. Uh, we tried some different recipes and different formulations with some local coffee vendors and uh, tried it out on our patrons at our bars. We liked it enough to do a seasonal release last year, 
it went over well enough that we're making it year round this year. Our guys uh, in marketing tell me that uh, it looks like your evening pint, but drinks like your morning cup. And that's really a good synopsis of that beer. Cold brewed uh, Arabica coffee, a little bit of vanilla and a blonde ale base. And it's one of the go-to, certainly a great evening. So can you tell us about the coffee that went into this? I was just looking at the can and I see that it says chicory coffee and natural vanilla flavor. I'm curious about that coffee though. Yeah, it, it is a little bit of a chicory f- uh, flavor. Uh, imagine having beignets in New Orleans at Cafe Du Monde. And that coffee with that bitterness is the chicory. And that's the flavor that we were looking for here. You know, you mentioned that, and now I want beignets in this beer. <laughs> Seriously. And I, and I'd be set up, man. I'd be okay, good to that, go. That's inspiration I'll take home with me. See, there you go. Absolutely, <laughs> man. Well, speaking of Catawba, uh, we talked about Pal- Palmetto, 25th anniversary party, oldest brewery in South Carolina. But Catawba has uh, been around for a little while, too. Their 20th anniversary is coming up on uh, July 20th of this year, correct? That is true. Just like you guys are passing your 20th radio station, we're passing our 20th year. It's going to work out great. We have a um, basically a long week full of celebrations planned. I think we have three new beers. We have a special surprise uh, that kind of draws in some family members from Catawba's history. And um, we're so excited to be able to uh, have this celebration in all of our locations, in Asheville, Charlotte, and in Morganton, North Carolina. You may even see a little bit of festivity down here in Charleston, South Carolina, to help us pass this wonderful milestone. So tell us about those three uh, new beers. I I saw a a note that... uh it, it was a nod to your past, present, and future. So that was very interesting. Can you tell us about that, or is it very secret at this point? I, I don't want to spill too much, but I will tell you that uh, you guys, uh, we were talking in some of the off hours here, or off minutes here, about some of the new first beers. Everyone had an amber ale or red ale. So we're going to redo one of our traditional red ales. Uh, we're going to do something that is a little neat spin on something that's a big seller for us right now. And... Um, the future one, let me just say, it's. I'm very proud of it. It's going to be amazing. Okay, we're we're intrigued. <laughs> so I, we I are don't, intrigued. I don't want to. I don't want to give everything away. If I do, my wife and my brother will kill me. Well, that's. Uh, what is your most? What are your popular beers at Catawba? I have to think peanut butter jelly time. Is yeah, one if, that does well. If you look at just the core beers, the things that we do every day, white zombie white ale. Uh, it's a Belgian wit with coriander and orange peel. Light, refreshing, five percent alcohol is what puts the roof on the building and the tires on the trucks. It's by far our biggest seller. Our um, Hot Nest Monster India Pale Ale is a nice, citrusy, big, bold IPA is our number two. Uh, Evening Joe that you're trying is our number three with a bullet. Just released this year, and it's doing great. You know, it's interesting to talk to breweries about what their hot beers are. And there was a conversation the other day on one of the online forums one user basically said every brewery should switch all their brews over to Northeast IPAs, hazy IPAs. <laughs> and you had some of the guys come in there and say, look, you know, we're, we're the geeks of this industry. We're the small percentage of the small percentage of people that follow all of this. And yes, Northeast IPAs, the hazy IPAs are super trendy, super popular. But for your average beer drinker and the, the community as a whole, these aren't the beers they're buying. You know, it's just uh, the the average drinker out there of the masses is not hunting down the hazies. They are not looking for the twenty dollar four packs, right? Oh, twenty four dollar four pack. Yes. Yeah. So, so we, you know, we've been in this business a long time, and we're we're blessed to have a few flagships that we can produce all the time. We make everything. We'll release well over a hundred beers this year. Uh, some of them will be big hazy IPAs. Our cloud cover series. Um, Rising Sun in the Cloud Cover series just came out uh, last month, and it is a big, bold, citrusy, hazy IPA. It's beautiful, but it, to us, is a chance to learn uh, and experiment a little bit to maybe flex our creative muscle. We know that we're going to be making a lot of White Zombie, a lot of Yuji Street IPA, a lot of Idle Speed, and a lot of Evening Joe, so that um, we can get that out of the five-state distribution. So speaking of the the experimental and the new IPAs, I noticed that uh, switching gears too to Palmetto, you've done a number of interesting, trendy uh, IPAs there, you know, brood IPAs, milkshake IPAs. I was like, uh, I think I even saw a session brood, which was really intriguing to me, and I, I had to bring that up. I had to find out what that was about. 
Yeah, there's a Session Brute IPA on tap. Uh, as soon as I build my cooler tonight, I'm going to go have one. It is light and bubbly, um, low alcohol. Again, it's a beer that is very, very dry. Uh, we use a different yeast and a different process so that we uh, get almost all of the residual sugar out of it. Uh, carbonate it. It's got some nice bright hops, but they're not overpowering. We kind of let the champagne-like bubbliness of the beer stand on its own. I really like that quality of the brutes. And again, an abated style, you know, people love them, hate them, or I actually hear more people talking to hate. Yeah, uh, I yeah. think it's. Which is unfortunate because a really well, and I think some of that in our era, Brian, may be that we haven't had a lot of good interpretations based locally, on what anyway. I know of them. And like the one we tried from Camino, in my opinion, based on what I've read about the style, that it seemed to be as true to it as you could be. And it was really nice. Yeah, that's that's really on point. It very very whiny, like grapey, very fruity character. It, I just thought it was interesting. You know, when I was reading through the various interesting beers that that you've done with Palmetto, especially the experimental things, I came across something called the Beer Aquarium. The Beer Aquarium. I have to ask about <laughs> yes. a Beer Aquarium. Okay, the Beer Aquariums. I really don't know that these exist anywhere else. I I spent 27 years working for the greatest glass company on the planet, Corning Incorporated. When I was building the Charlotte Brewery, I put up a room with a glass wall that opens to the tasting room. And in that, in behind that uh, glass wall, I put in two open fermentation tanks. Now, a lot of people do have open fermentation tanks, and they're wonderful. You can watch the beer ferment from the top down. But we went the extra step and actually put in those tanks one glass wall. So not only can you look from above into the beer, you can look through the side of the tank into the beer and see what goes on. We call them the beer aquariums because you can honestly watch the yeast moving around in the beer ferment and you can do it all from the comfort of a chair while you're sipping a pint and uh, looking through the glass. And you know, if you're not a home brewer that has never brewed on your own, you know, having clear carboys at home, you can get pretty uh, turbulent inside yeah, sure. of a fermentation. So, you know, all that stuff, it's very interesting to see how much swirling is going on in there that, Yeast is a little more feisty than you might think. It'll really get stuff churning. These are 20-barrel tanks with a little head space, so call it 700 gallons a piece. And uh, we've done everything from those particular beers you mentioned uh, from Palmetto. We even made an ice bock there and with an ice beer, ice bock, E-I-S uh, bock. Um, we freeze the beer in that open fermenter, and you can do that without damaging the tank. And you can draw the beer out from under the ice, out the uh, out the outlet of the tank. So we actually uh, made it this winter, and it was wonderful. Intense flavors, bumps up the alcohol a little bit, uh, and a nice, dark, satisfying lager. I want to go set and watch the sunset over the beer aquarium. That's right. <laughs> over the beer aquarium. There. I want to drink some ice bock while I do it. That is ice a style bock. I have not heard in a while, and I'm so excited to hear it again. Man. Yeah, you don't hear about those much. Not at all. Not, not a big popular style. Well, Billy, we're getting close to wrapping up here. Uh, anything else you want folks to know about Palmetto or Catawba? Well, what I, what I would love for people to do is uh, to support the people that support craft brewing and Palmetto and Catawba. Thank you guys for doing what you do. Uh, thanks to all the fellow brewers out here. This is a hell of an industry, and I'm a 20-plus year veteran of it and proud to be in it. Just keep on uh, keeping on, guys. So if people want to keep up with what you're doing, where would be the best place for them to go, like Facebook or something like that for both breweries? We are very active on all the social media channels, uh, Instagram, Facebook. Each brewery has its own Facebook page and an events page. Uh, so we're pretty easy to find. And if you really uh, run out of, uh, of ways to find us or you want to know something else, Billy at CatawbaBrewing.com. I'll answer anybody. There you go. Go right to the source right to and the get source. the info you need, right? Yep. Uh, absolutely. Well, Billy, we really appreciate you uh, joining us. We had a great chat with you here. I appreciate you guys. You guys are really good at this. And uh, again, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show. Coming up next week, we're going to be talking with Green Man Brewing, another Asheville brewery oh, yeah. there, Brian. So for more craft beer info, follow us online. We are Beer Guys Radio on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks again for tuning in. Have a great week, and don't forget to drink local. Cheers. Cheers.